This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Great worship weekend to you, Alfred Street Baptist Church. What a joy it is to greet you as we celebrate this weekend, not just our God, but the man of God who has been given by God to this people known as Alfred Street. I am so grateful to be back in this sacred space called the Sanctuary of the Alfred Street Baptist Church. And I thank God for your pastor, my friend and brother, for more than 40 years, for the friendship and the fellowship that we have shared throughout these years, and for his permission to allow me to come back again this year and share in the celebration of both pastor and people. Thank you, Dr. Wesley, for your kindness. Thank you for your leadership. Thank you for your commitment to excellence, to the things of God as you lead the Alfred Street Baptist Church. To God be the glory for you, my brother. I am so grateful that God has blessed us with you, and I'm grateful that God has blessed you with the Alfred Street Baptist Church. Good to be back with you, and I praise God for this experience of worship in which we are engaged. There's a word from the Lord today, and I hope that you have your Bibles. If you do, I invite your attention to what may be a familiar passage of Scripture to many Bible readers. It is found in the Old Testament book of Second Chronicles, the Old Testament book of Second Chronicles at chapter 20. The Old Testament book of Second Chronicles at chapter 20, and there's a little line at the conclusion of verse 12, that has arrested my attention for this day, and I hope it will be a blessing to you. Second Chronicles chapter 20, and the last line of verse 12 from the New International Version reads like this. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. That's enough. Amen. Praise God for his holy word. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are are on you. And for these few moments that we spend together this day, I want to talk from the subject, their eyes were watching God. Their eyes were watching God. My literary enthusiasts already know that those words of subject are not unique to me. Those are not new words from my own creativity, imagination, and mind. No, those are the words of that phenomenal book written by Zora Neale Hurston during the Harlem Renaissance of the same title, Their Eyes Were Watching God. It speaks of a little Florida town and the workings of that town and interpersonal relationships in that town. And it is a book that was assigned to us when we were coming in as fresh-faced freshmen at Fisk University in Nashville, Tennessee. Before we arrived on campus, we were told to secure the book and read the book in its entirety, for there would be discussion about the book once we arrived. And during freshman orientation, Dr. Wesley, we had constant dialogue throughout those first few days about various aspects of the book, Their Eyes Were Watching God by Zora Neale Hurston. The very conclusion of that time, one of the administrators stood up and said, young people, we are glad you secured the book. We're glad you read the book. But we wanted to be sure that in addition to reading the book, you took note of the title of the book. For the title of the book will be, will be necessary for you to be successful throughout these years you spend at Fisk University. I know that you'll see many things while you're here. You'll encounter many experiences along the way. But in the midst of everything you go through, this administrator said you need to keep your eyes on God. <laughs> He said that, that, that on that day, and it has stuck with me until this day, that if we're going to be successful, if we're going to be effective in this journey, it's going to require a focus, a concentration on a God who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all we can ask or think. Their eyes were watching God. And I submit on this day that every one of us who understands this thing called life with its ups and downs, with its twists and turns, with its peaks and valleys, with its ins and outs, all of us who have lived life for a little while have recognized that despite your acumen and ability, despite your expertise and experience, there will be some moments in life where you, like the psalmist in Psalm 121, will have to lift your eyes to the hills from which comes your help, your help, our help. My help comes from the Lord, which made heaven and earth. This day, my brothers and sisters, I focus our attention on this idea 
that we ought to keep our eyes on God. And I find it in this passage a very significant phrase that uh, as Jehoshaphat the king stood up before the people, he had the temerity, yes, the audacity to stand before all of the people of that region, that kingdom, and say in no uncertain terms that he had no idea what to do, <laughs> but his eyes were watching God. His eyes were on God. I submit that all of us will have some moment in our lives where we won't know what to do. I submit that every one of us who is alive, every one of us who has breath in our bodies will come to the point in life where we throw up both of our hands in exasperation, in frustration, wondering how in the world are we going to push through to the next scene and situation of our lives. Every one of us will have some moment of aggravation, yes, consternation, scratching our heads trying to figure out how do we make progress? How are we productive in the midst of all of the circumstances through which we have to live? I submit today that Jehoshaphat gives us a good picture of what each, each one of us should focus on, should concentrate on when we find ourselves with our backs up against the wall, not knowing how we're going to handle the life circumstance that is before us. Here again, the words of Jehoshaphat, he says in no uncertain terms, we don't know what to do, but our eyes are on you. I guess I need to give you the context. So as Dr. Wesley would say, you would appreciate the content. Because if you look at 2 Chronicles chapter 20, you'll find out that from the beginning of the chapter, there is a, a situation that is beyond the control of King Jehoshaphat. He is dealing with the fact that he has now three groups of people who are coming to make war on him at one time. If your Bible is open, if your app is unlocked, if you dare read the scriptures, you'll find out. And the Bible says that the people of Moab and Ammon and Mount Seir, the Munites, are coming to make war on Jehoshaphat at one time. Now, this is this is this is frustrating to be sure. For in the preceding chapters, we found out that although Jehoshaphat has not been the perfect king, he's certainly been a productive and good king. He set up governance. He's done everything he should have done to ensure that the people would have the way, a way by which they could go to someone for assistance when they needed it. He's done well to make sure that the kingdom was in order. But by the time he gets everything straight in the preceding chapters, here comes chapter 20. And we find out that after all of that had taken place, here come the people of Moab, Ammon, and Mount Seir coming to make war on him. Isn't it interesting? That after you get everything in order, there's always something to show up trying to cause disorder. Isn't it interesting how after you've tried to do everything you knew how to do to set up things in the way it should be set up, here comes something or somebody trying to dismantle everything you put in order. Isn't it interesting that after eight years of a good presidency, we got to deal with four years of foolishness, and now we got to try to put everything back in order again. Isn't it interesting how everything is seemingly going well for a season, and then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, here comes something trying to dismantle it. And I'd be okay, Dr. Wesley, if it was just one thing that I had to deal with, but here... His old Jehoshaphat having to deal with three things at one time. Yeah, you said, we said, somebody said, if it ain't one thing, it's another. What if it's three things happening at the exact same time? The people of Moab, Ammon, and Mount Seir are all coming against him at one time. He got to deal with medical challenges and family challenges and financial challenges all at the same time. You got to deal with grief and you got to deal with disaster in the community and you got to deal with these storms around the country, around the, around the world, all at the same time. Here we are, some of us who are listening to me right now are having to deal with multiple issues all at the same time. I'm all right if it's just one thing. What if your issues have issues? What, what about when your problems beget other problems? Here they are, dealing with the reality that three groups of people are coming to make war on them at one time. And I like old Jehoshaphat. He knows how to handle a multiplicity of problems. He knows how to handle the diverse problems that come at one time. He, he chooses, my brothers and sisters, not 
to call a church meeting. No, he calls a prayer meeting. Yeah, he does not call a business meeting for all the people of the kingdom to come down and, and just talk it through, hash it out. No, he calls a prayer meeting. Listen to what the Bible says. He called everybody down to the temple. He said, we need to talk to God about this. And what I read in your hearing today, my friends, is the conclusion of his prayer. His prayer begins in verse 6. It concludes at verse 12. And for those verses, he is communicating with the creator, talking to God about how they're going to get out of this situation they've just gotten into. How they're going to deal with the rough reality that is that they are confronted with. Here he is. And when he closes his prayer, his words are the words of our text for today. God, we don't know what to do, but our eyes are on you. Now, child of God, I love his transparency. I don't know if you can be that, that transparent before everybody. Did I mention he brought everybody down to the temple? He wanted to fast and pray. He wanted everybody to know that we can't handle this by ourselves. We need divine guidance if we're going to deal with this. And in the midst of all of that, with his acumen and ability, with his expertise and experience, Jehoshaphat has the unmitigated gall to say in front of all these people, we don't know what to do. But our eyes are on you. I thank God for a brother who could be honest in the face of adversity. I thank God for a brother who didn't have to put on airs because everybody was watching. This brother did not have to act as if he had it all together just because he was in the presence of the entirety of the company of the people of Jerusalem and Judah. No, he made it abundantly clear. He was completely transparent. I don't know what to do. And with all your ability, with all of your acumen, with all of your experience and expertise, there will come some moment in time where you have to throw up both your hands and say, I don't know what to do. So what do you do when you don't know what to do? <laughs> how do you handle it when you don't know how to handle it? How do you keep on going when you feel like giving up? I submit today. That Jehoshaphat teaches us some things here in 2 Chronicles chapter 20 that just might help us when we don't know what to do. We don't know what to do, but our eyes, there it is, are on you. How do you keep your eyes on God when you know that you've got some enemies advancing against you? How do you keep your eyes on God when you know that frustration is mounting all around you? I submit that old Jehoshaphat can say our eyes are on you first of all because of God's past participation. Yeah, because of God's past participation. It's right there in your Bible, not in verse 12. Jump back up to verse 6 at the beginning of his prayer. He says when he starts praying, oh God, watch, God of our ancestors. Stop right there. Hold up. Wait a minute. That's good news all by itself. Jehoshaphat says, I know some things about God. And those things have not been taught to me simply uh, by my own experiences with God. But even the generations that preceded me have taught me that the God that we pray to, the God we serve, is a God who is able to do what nobody else can do. He says, God of our ancestors hold up wait a minute please don't read too fast past that little detail of the text because it seems to me that there's been a generational relationship with God that has rooted Jehoshaphat in the reality that although he's alarmed he is still resolved to stand flat footed and talk to the God that his mama Nim talked to talk to the God that his ancestors trusted in talk to the God that has been with them through out generations can't you hear Moses praying <laughs> in Psalm 90 Lord thou hast been our dwelling place in all generations and there's somebody today who is grateful you had a mama or a daddy who took you to church and taught you about the Lord somebody who's listening to me today can get happy even if you got to get happy in that house all by yourself because you had somebody maybe it was a Sunday school teacher of another generation maybe it was a preacher of another generation who taught you that the God that we pray to can be trusted can be depended upon the God we talk to the God 
God we worship, the God we serve, is a God who is with us in every season and situation of life. And that God is not just your God. You're not just some Johnny or Joanne come lately who just hooked up with God. No, God has been blessing folk for generations, holding on to folk who couldn't hold on themselves when they couldn't deal with the life's reality through which they were going. God was there. And today, I submit that he's the same God yesterday, today, and forever. And if our mothers and fathers could trust him, if our grandmothers and grandfathers could trust God, if our grand great grands could trust in that God, surely you and I can trust him as well. If they trusted God with less, how much more ought we trust God with all that God has given to us, has committed into our care? I submit today that you and I have a strong foundation on which to stand, that there are some people who came before us who trusted in this God, and that God has been for them their dwelling place. And if he did it before, he can do it again. Same God back then, same God right now, same God back then. This God is faithful, watch, to a thousand generations. God of our ancestors, yeah. The God who's been with us along this journey. The God who walked with our ancestors when they were in captivity. The God who was with our ancestors when they were meandering through the wilderness. The God who allowed our ancestors to cross over the Red Sea. The God who was with our people in, in slavery. The God who was with our people through the civil rights era, through Jim Crow and through Jane Crowism. The God who's been with our people when they didn't feel as if they could go on any longer. And that God says, I'm still with you to hold you when you can't hold yourself. Is there anybody who is grateful that the God we serve is not just a God of yesterday, but this God is still a God of right now and that God is trustworthy even now. And we can pray to him, keep our eyes on him because we've already seen what he did in generations gone by and he is still able to do it today. I submit today my friends that we can trust God. We can keep our eyes on God based on God's past participation. He's the God of our ancestors. We keep on reading because if you keep reading your Bible you'll find out he's likewise the God who handled their enemies. It's right there in verse 7. He's not just the God of our ancestors. He's the God who's handled our enemies. The Bible says he drove out the inhabitants of the land in front of their faces that God has been fighting for them. Yeah. That God has been working on their behalf. That God has ensured that their enemies would still be their footstool. God has ensured, watch, that he prepare a table before them. Yes. In the presence of their enemies. Then there's somebody listening to me today who can testify that the God you serve is still a God who handles your enemies. There's, God, there's somebody listening to me right now who can testify. God God still handles your haters. He, he still makes ways out of no way, even when folk are digging ditches and, 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 trap, and setting traps to, to supplant you. Somebody can testify God knows how to handle your enemies better than you know how to handle your enemies. He's the God who drove out our enemies from before our very faces. He's not just the God of our ancestors, the God who drove out our enemies, but he's the God who hears us when we pray. Yeah, he's the God who answers our prayers. I'm right there in your Bible, haven't left it yet. Because if you keep reading, you'll find out they built a sanctuary in that land when God drove out their enemies. And when they built the sanctuary, they told God, we're going to call on you. <laughs> Whenever we have some issue or circumstance, if calamity rises, we don't know how to handle it ourselves. So we're going to call on you. And we believe that when we call on you, you're going to do something about our situation. Now, you've got to remember this is Second Chronicles. And if you back up to Second Chronicles chapter 7 at verse 14, when they built that temple, they dedicated it, Solomon did. When Solomon dedicated that temple, he said, Lord, listen, listen, listen. When your people call on you in this place, I want your eyes to be open and your ears to be attentive to everything that they pray. And God said in chapter 7, listen here, because you asked me every time you pray in this place, my eyes will be open, my ears will be attentive to the prayers that you pray. But that's not all. Dr. Weston knows it's right there in verse 14 of chapter 7. God then says, if my people <laughs> who are called by my name 
will humble themselves and pray, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven, I'll forgive their sin and heal their land. Oh, child of God, somebody needs to know that we still serve a God who answers our prayers. I need somebody in that cyber community, that cyber sanctuary to go ahead and testify. You got to testify all by yourself that God still answers prayer, that God still hears and answers the prayers of his people. Why do I keep my eyes on God? <laughs> because of God's past participation. He promised that he would hear me when I pray. He promised that he'd drive my enemies away. He promised that just as he was with my ancestors, he would be with me. And so today, my friends, I submit that you and I can keep our eyes on God based on God's past participation. But can I push it just a bit farther than that? Because if I push it a bit farther, you'll find out that not only do we keep our eyes on God based upon his past participation, but I submit that you and I can keep our eyes on God based upon his present partnership. Yeah, his present partnership. I'm still in your Bible. I left verse 12. I went down to verse 13 because in verse 13, your Bible says that all the men of Judah with their wives and their children and their little ones stood there before the Lord. Let me give it to you again. They, they just prayed. Uh, Jehoshaphat led them in prayer. He's down there praying. Verse 6 to verse 12. And then in verse 13, your Bible gives, gives a little interesting commentary. All the men of Judah with their wives and children and little ones, they just stood there before the Lord. Let me give it to you the third time. They tell me the third time is a charm. Let me see if I can give it to you one more again. Bible says... That uh, after he prayed from verse 6 to 12, uh, verse 13, all the men of Judah with their wives and children and little ones, they just stood there before the Lord. Here's the inference. The inference is they literally suggested to God, listen, we're not going to take a step until you order our steps. We're just going to stand here and wait on you because we believe that if we pray, the next responsibility that God has is to answer our prayer. God says, if you call on me, I will answer you and show you great and mighty things. And so now they wait on the Lord. Wouldn't we be a whole lot better if we'd wait on God after we prayed instead of just moving into doing what we think we need to do or what needs to be done next in the situation? Wouldn't we be a whole lot more, more, more impressed with ourselves and with God if we learned how to wait on God? Wouldn't we be much farther down the road if we had waited on God instead of made some decisions ourselves? There's somebody listening to me who can testify you made some pretty bad decisions because you chose not to wait on the Lord. There, there's somebody, I'm glad you're in anonymity right now. You don't have to look like you're guilty, the guilty person about whom I'm speaking. You can just sit there and testify to yourself. If I had waited on God, I wouldn't have made some of the poor decisions that I made. I wouldn't have made some of the wrong choices that I had made. If I had waited on God, I wouldn't have been in that situation, in that circumstance, in that relationship. If I had just waited on God. Oh, I hear Isaiah coming down through the annals of time. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They'll mount up with wings as eagles run and not be weary. They'll walk and not faint. I hear you, David. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage. He will strengthen your heart. Wait, I say on the Lord. Some of us today would do a whole lot better if we learned how to wait. Trust in God. Wait on the Lord. And so all the men of Judah with their wives and children and little ones, they just stood there before the Lord. That's verse 13, but then verse 14 says, there's a guy by the name of Jehaziel, and he's a Levite. He's of priestly class. He's a Levite, and the Spirit of the Lord comes upon him. And when the Spirit of the Lord comes upon him, listen to what Jehaziel said. Uh, 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 King Jehoshaphat and all the inhabitants of Judah, relax, chill, quit stressing. Come on down off that ledge. Everything's going to be all right. Because God says, you will not have to fight this battle. Uh-oh. Hold up. Wait a minute. I think I heard there was a series going on at the Alfred Street Baptist Church. Something said talking about the battle is the Lord's. If you've got your Bible open, you'll find out that when Jehaziel starts speaking, he says, stop stressing, people. Stop tripping. Don't, don't get ahead of yourselves. Don't fall out. Don't jump out the window. Listen here. Here's the good news. The battle uh, is not yours. It's God's. Oh, child of God, that's good news every day of the week that the battle 
will is not ours, it's God's. And that ought to bless your socks off because you know good and well you can't handle that battle like God can. Somebody ought to be excited that you don't have to handle the battle because you have a God who is strong and mighty, who is able to do for you what you cannot do for yourself. Don't you hear the psalmist saying, lift up your head, O ye gates, and be ye lifted up, ye everlasting doors, and the king of glory shall come in. Somebody ask the question, who is this king of glory? The answer is returned, the Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Is there anybody listening to me on this day who can testify? I'm so grateful that I have a God who never leaves me in battles by myself, but he is able to do exceeding abundantly above all I can ask or think according to the power that is at work within me and he still fights battles for his people. The battle is not yours. It's the Lord. I thank God for that. He lets them know in no uncertain terms that you don't have to be stressed out. You don't have to be weary. You don't have to be frustrated because you have a God who is on your side. Now, this blesses me because he just talked about how God was on the side of his ancestors, how God had blessed the generations that preceded him. And I came today to tell somebody that just like God blessed our ancestors, hallelujah, just as God delivered our people, just as God was with those who came before us, you need to hear me when I tell you in the word of that old good song we love to sing in church. Listen here. The Lord is blessing me right now. Is there anybody who can get happy if you got to get happy all by yourself and testify that the God we serve did not run out of blessings with our ancestors. That the God we serve did not run out of favor with those who came before us. But the God we serve is still on our side to do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. And the Lord is blessing me right right now yes lord he's blessing me right now and i love this church family because he says you don't have to worry about it <laughs> you don't have to stress about it that's a good word that the bible can, from the old testament through the new testament is always trying to tell us stop being so stressed out yeah. from the old testament to the new testament trying to tell us stop being so anxious as a matter of fact the apostle paul puts it this way be careful for nothing anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving yeah let your request be made known unto God and the peace of God, yes, Lord, which passes all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Is there anybody in this in this cyber community today who can testify that God knows how to calm you down, hey, that God knows how to allay your fears, that God knows how to give you peace in the midst of the storm? Oh, yes, that's what's happening. The enemy's still advancing, but God gives peace in the midst of a storm. The enemy's still on their way, but God speaks a word in the midst of the storm to let them know, I got you. I know exactly where you are. I know exactly what you need, and I know exactly what to do at the exact moment that it needs to be done. I need you to be encouraged today, my sister. I need you to be encouraged today, my brother. Your God knows exactly what you need, and just when you need it most, and God is still on your side to do for you what you cannot do for yourself. Is there anybody who can hear those saints singing, be not dismayed? What air be tied God will take care of you and God is on your side right now God is working on your behalf right now God is working miracles right now while you trying to figure it out <laughs> he's already working it out and somebody needs to be encouraged on this day to know that the God we serve is still in complete control and there is absolutely nothing too hard for our God well I've held you too long I apologize, but every time I talk about God, I get happy, and I just begin to keep talking a little while longer than I should. But let me, let me close the little message when I tell you that the God we serve is able to fight our battles. God we serve is, is kind enough to be in relationship with us, to do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. In this world where it seems there's so much upheaval, so much racism, sexism, classism, ageism, that uh, all these advancements are happening at one time. All of these enemies are bombarding us at one time. Here's God saying, I got you. And we can trust that God because of God's past participation. We can trust that God because of his present partnership. 
But can I tell you as I close this message that we can trust that God based upon his pending promises. Yeah, his pending promises. I'm still in your Bible. I haven't left chapter 20 yet. I just moved now from verse 14 all the way down to verse 17 because now Jehaziel is speaking to these people. He's told them, you don't have to fight this battle. Battle is yours. It, it, battle is not yours. It's the Lord's. Then he says, this is what you need to do. Just stand still <laughs> and see the salvation of the Lord. Since your eyes are on God anyway, God's going to give you something to see. He's going to let you see his salvation. I wish I had all day to talk to you. I tell you exactly how he showed them his salvation. I tell you how he defeated the enemy and then they, they allowed them to get the spoils there of their enemy and have victory over their adversity in a way that they never would have imagined. Boy, I don't have time to get all the way to the end of the chapter. I just want to give you the promises that God makes to his people. Watch this. Before they go into battle. Before they go into battle, God says through his prophet Jehaziel that Levi he says, listen, I need you to let my people know I will be with you. Yeah, that's verse 17. Then in verse 20, he says, I will uphold you. And in that very verse, verse 20, he says, you will be successful. Yes. Well, let me give it to you again. I hope that you just at least waved a hand, nodded your head, tapped your foot while you were in that house or wherever you may be, because you need to hear the promises of God that are the same for us as they were for God's people in 2 Chronicles chapter 20. He says, listen, I know you're going into a battle. I know you got enemies advancing. I know you don't know how to handle this yourself, but this is what you need to know. You need to know that when you deal with this situation, I will be with you. And while you're going through this circumstance, I will uphold you. And you need to know that when the dust settles and the smoke clears, you will be successful. Now, child of God, that's, that's the end of the little message. I need to unpack those three little sub points just a bit and I'll be out of your way. I like it, don't you? Because oftentimes we feel like we're all by ourselves when we get in the mire of our predicaments. Oftentimes we think that nobody is around to help us, to aid us, to assist us. And God says, you don't have to rely on everybody else. Here's my promise to you. I will be with you. <laughs> is there anybody who's still excited about the fact that God says, I'll never leave you? nor forsake you. Somebody ought to be excited about the fact that the old saint sang the song and he walks with me. Yeah. He talks with me and he tells me that I'm his own and the joy that we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. I need you to hear me child of God when I tell you God says I will be with you. But that's not the only promise. God also says I will uphold you. Ah, I like that because if you'll be honest about it, you and I have to test there's some seasons in our lives. There's some scenes that show up in our lives that wear us out. There's some moments in our lives where we feel like we're going down for the count and we'll never bounce back again. And God says when you're dealing with those kinds of rough realities, when life has knocked the life out of you, you need to hear God say, I will uphold you. Is there anybody who's ever had God to pick you back up? Ever had God to dust you off? Ever had God to rejuvenate you and restore you and revive you and re-energize you? Oh, child of God, you ought to be happy happy on this day that God says I will uphold you but that's not all God says when it's all said and done you need to know that no matter how big bad bold and bodacious your enemies are the good news is you will be successful oh child of God that's good news every day of the week that when everything is said and done God says victory shall be ours is there anybody who is grateful that the God we serve still calls causes us to triumph. Anybody grateful that the God we serve still makes us the head and not the tail? Anybody excited that we're still above and not beneath? Anybody still get happy that we're more than conquerors through him who loves us? Somebody ought to be grateful that victory shall be ours. It does not matter how bad that national landscape looks. It does not matter how ugly that scene is on your job. It does not matter how bad that circumstance as is in your home. I came to tell you that if you hold to God's unchanging hand, God knows how to give us success and victory and help us to overcome despite the challenges you face. I'm so excited to profess that to the Alfred Street Church today, but I likewise profess it to the 
pastor of the Alpha Street Church who celebrates 14 years today. You've been watching God all through this journey, showing you his power, showing you his ability, showing you his authority. And today you can testify that the same God who spoke to Jehoshaphat has spoken to you, Dr. Howard John Wesley. And he told you, I will be with you. Yes. And he told you, I will uphold you. And he told you, you will be successful. And today you can testify that God keeps his promises. Today you can testify that God keeps his word. The Bible says heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall stand forever. The promises of God are yea and amen. So I know there's a whole lot of stuff in this world that you can put your gaze upon. I know there's a lot of stuff in this world that you can put your eyes on, but will you please take a page out of 2 Chronicles chapter 20 and even when you don't know what to do, I dare you to be like Jehoshaphat and say, God, my eyes are on you. Their eyes were watching God.